I'd like to introduce someone to you who will introduce the author. Known as the editor-in-chief of the Daily Business Review, please join me in welcoming David Lyons. Well, thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to one of the first afternoon sessions of the Miami Book Fair International. This session's book is What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets by Michael Sandel of Harvard University. On a preliminary note, I would like to declare that this introduction is free to everyone. There is no charge. <laughs> Michael is quite possibly the most prominent political philosopher in the United States. He has a wide following not only in this country, but also in the United Kingdom. His work has been the subject of television series on PBS and on the BBC. On BBC Radio 4, he conducts a program series called The Public Philosopher. Just ahead, of our public, uh, just ahead of our presidential election, he hit the road to challenge voters and, according to the BBC, lay bare the deeper moral questions bound up in the noisy Romney and Obama campaigns. In one presentation, he played off the now famous Obama question with a session called, Who Built It? Is the American vision of individual responsibility for one's own success a myth? A native of Minneapolis, uh, Michael attended high school in Los Angeles, is a graduate of Brandeis University, and holds a PhD in philosophy from Oxford University. At Harvard, Michael is the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government, where he, he has taught political philosophy since 1980. The year 2009 seems to have been a watershed year for both Michael and Harvard. By then, more than 15,000 students had taken his famous course, Justice, which provided the basis for his previous book, Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do? It was in 2009 that Michael and the university allowed public television stations across the country to sit in on the course, where topics uh, ranged from Wall Street bonuses to same-sex marriage. It drew the attention of the New York Times, which published an article entitled, Morals Class is Starting, Please Pass the Popcorn. The difficulty in this course is in teaching what you already know, he told the Times. It works by taking what we know from familiar, unquestioned settings and making it strange. Thus, would you switch a runaway trolley from one track to another if it meant killing one person instead of five? What about a surgeon killing one healthy person and using his organs so that five people who needed organ transplants can live? Is that moral? Why not? Why should we listen to Michael Sandel? Consider these lines from What Money Can't Buy. He is addressing one of the largest political questions of our time. Is there something wrong with the world in which most everything is for sale? Without quite realizing it, he argues, we have drifted from having a market economy to being a market society. Is this where we want to be? Said Michael Ignatieff of the New Republic, he is trying to force open a space for a discourse on civic virtue that he believes has been abandoned by both left and right. I'd like to note that when addressing audiences, Michael does not lecture the people in the room. He fully engages the people in the room. As is the case in Socr Socratic dialogue, he wants their input, and I'll expect he'll want yours today. It's a privilege to introduce the author of What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Michael J. Sandel. Thank you, David. Thank you all for coming. Today, I would like to engage all of us in a discussion of the question of the book. It's an easy question to state, at least not so easy to answer. What should be the role of money and markets in our society? Today, there are fewer and fewer things that money can't buy. If you're sentenced to a jail term in Santa Barbara, California, just in case that happens to any one of you, <laughs> you should know that if you don't like the standard accommodations, you can buy a prison cell upgrade. <laughs> it's true. For how much do you suppose? How much do you think it costs? $5,000? It's on a nightly basis. $90 a night. Or if you're a tourist, it's 
Suppose you go to Washington, D.C. You want to sit in on a congressional hearing. But there may be a very long line if it's a popular hearing. And you may not like standing on long lines. You can now go to a company called linestanding.com. <laughs> they pay them a certain amount of money. They will hire someone, usually a homeless person or someone who needs the work, to hold a place online for hours and hours, overnight if need be. And when the hearing begins, you can take your place in the line and go into the hearing room. The same thing, you can do the same thing, by the way, if you want to sit in on an oral argument before the US Supreme Court. Linestanding.com. Or suppose you want to contribute to alleviating a social tragedy in this country. Each year, thousands of babies born to drug-addicted mothers. There's a charity you could contribute to that tries to use a market mechanism to solve this terrible problem. They offer any drug-addicted woman $300 to be sterilized, the use of a market incentive. Or suppose you have a new drug. Let's say you're a pharmaceutical company. You've, you have a new drug that you want to market to the public. You can market it directly to consumers. You've seen those ads on television. If you, if you see the ads on the nightly news or on sporting events for prescription drugs, you could be give, forgiven for thinking that the greatest health crisis in the world is not malaria or sleeping sickness, you know what I'm thinking of, <laughs> but a rampant epidemic of erectile dysfunction. <laughs> Marketing drugs directly to consumers. These are signs of the times. Over the last three decades, almost without realizing it, we have drifted from having a market economy to becoming a market society. The difference is this. A market economy is a tool, a valuable and effective tool, for organizing productive activity. But a market society is different. It's a place where almost everything is up for sale. It's a way of life in which market values and market relationships reach into almost every sphere of life. Consider books, which we gather here to celebrate. Now, take the practice of product placement. It's familiar in movies and in television, but not in books. You don't see books with product placement. Well, uh, not until recently. A few years ago, there was a British novelist, Faye Weldon. Have you heard of her? She was commissioned by an Italian jewelry company, Bulgari, to write a book with product placement. She entered into a deal that said, in exchange for a certain payment, she, in her novel, would mention Bulgari at least a dozen times. The title of the book, aptly enough, was The Bulgari Connection. <laughs> she exceeded the number of required mentions, mentioning Bulgari 34 times. Now, some critics didn't think much of it. They criticized the clunkiness of the product-laden prose that resulted from this arrangement. For example, here's one sentence from the book. A Bulgari necklace in the hand is worth two in the bush, said Doris. <laughs> or this one. Quote, they snuggled happily together for a time all passion spent, and she met him at Bulgari that lunchtime. Fortunately, product placement in books hasn't really caught on. <laughs> but I suspect that with the advent of electronic publishing, the experience of reading is going to be brought in closer and closer proximity to commercial advertising. Last year, Amazon put out two different versions 
of the Kindle. Many of you here probably have a Kindle. Read books on them? One was the standard version. The other was identical to the standard version, but it was $40 less. And the only difference was that for the cheaper model, you had to be willing to endure rolling advertising on the home page and the screensaver. But you save $40. Why worry about this tendency? Why worry about the reach of market values and market reasoning into spheres of life and social practices traditionally governed by other values? Well, one reason to worry is that sometimes marketizing a good changes its character and its meaning. And, and sometimes making, uh, putting a price tag on something may crowd out values, ways of understanding that good worth caring about. Let's take a controversial example to do with education. Many big school districts around the country are struggling with the problem of low achievement, low academic achievement and motivation, especially among kids who come from families and backgrounds where they weren't encouraged from a young age to read and to learn. These school districts, some of them, are experimenting with cash incentives to motivate academic achievement. Paying kids to get good grades, to score well on standardized exams. They've tried this in New York City, in Washington, D.C., in Chicago. $50 for an A, $35 for a B. In Dallas, they've tried offering second graders $2 for each book they read. Now, some people think this is a promising idea. Other people aren't very happy about it. So, Let's have a discussion here and begin by taking a, a survey of opinion. If you were the superintendent of one of these school districts and you were approached with this proposal, how many think it's a good idea worth trying and how many would object in principle? Let's see first those of you who, how many would object? How many would not like this idea? Quite a few. And how many think it, it's worth trying. All right, we have a pretty good division of opinion. Let's begin by those who object. Who is willing to explain, to offer your reason? Why do you think this would be objectionable in principle? Anyone? Who will start us off? Yes, yeah, stand up and we'll get you a microphone. Go ahead. I, I would Over here. Well, I would object because there's a basic value in learning. There's a basic value in learning, a ba basic excitement about learning new things. If you start paying for that, you remove that basic excitement. Because let's say someone reads a book because they like it, then they like it and they'll read another book. But if you pay a kid to read a book and give them money, then the next book, if they read it and they don't get money, they're not going to like it as well. So the paying will, may dull their motivation to read. Exactly. And tell us your name. Adele Sandberg. Adele, thank you for that. Stay there for a minute. Did you want to add to that? You're also against. Stand up and tell us. Thank you. I agree with her. I think that you're putting the wrong emphasis on the goal. The goal is not necessarily uh, to uh, make money, but to uh, gain knowledge and enjoyment. To gain knowledge and enjoyment is the proper goal of teaching. And the money, wait and tell us your name. I'm Janice Penlin. All right, Janice. So Janice and Adele have raised objections. Now we need to hear from someone who thinks it is worth a try You've heard the objections. What would, you, what would you say in defense of this idea? Yes, right there. Stand up. We'll get you a microphone. Hi. 
depending on the person's background, perhaps this is a motivational tool to make them understand, oh, gee, maybe I can benefit from reading. And when they do read, they get turned on to reading, and they get some kind of monetary value. So, and what's your name? I'm uh, Melanie Cohen. Melanie. So, Melanie, you say the goal is to get them turned on to reading, but maybe the money can kickstart a good habit, where as others worry that the money will actually crowd out the good habit. You don't think that that will necessarily happen. It might actually start the habit. Are there others who think this policy is worth a try? Yes, in the cap. The man with the cap. Go ahead. Stand up and we'll get you a microphone. Stand up and tell us your name. Well, the question would be, would you pick your career based on how much money you make? That would automatically cancel out so many careers that don't pay much, but are very rewarding. And do you think people should or should not choose their careers based on the money? I don't think they should base it, not everybody, base it on monetary value. If they want to be a, a poet or they want, whatever it is they want, shouldn't be determined by the monetary value all the time. And do you think paying kids for good grades may get them in the habit of choosing a career based on money? I would think that's the way it works. And what's your name? David Robertson. David. So the, the, the young people would think that's the way it works. But isn't that the way it works? <laughs> it shouldn't. You're saying it shouldn't work that way. Even if we view careers that way. Yes. Just from the aisle. Yes. Stand up. Well, I think that parents incent, uh, encourage kids to do things by paying them or saying they'll take them to a movie, and the kids learn to do it. And same with children in schools where they don't see their parents read, books aren't part of their culture, same idea. And, and so you would favor this? Yes, very much so. If, if it gets kids to read who wouldn't otherwise read, sure. If it works. If it works. If it doesn't work, you only pay them once. All right, wait, wait, and tell, us, and tell us your name. Stay there. Marilyn Himmel. Wait, Marilyn, keep the microphone. I have a follow-up question. Okay. You give the analogy of parents. Yes. Paying their kids or giving their kids rewards for, what, for studying, learning, getting good grades. Did, you, did you ever pay your children for getting good grades? Never, but I didn't have to. <laughs> They uh, did well. I'm in a different family, different, different household, but in a household where this isn't encouraged and the school is doing the encouraging because the parents haven't, where the kids aren't exposed and the, this is the responsibility of a school is to educate. Parents aren't helping it along, the school has to do uh, heroic things. Heroic things? Yes, heroic things. And heroic things. things may mean, may include $50 for an A. No, you said $2 a book. Two. <laughs> Different, you know, let's Her be reasonable. <laughs> heroic things within the bounds of economy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, I'm a former teacher many, many, many years ago, and I think that this um, suggestion shows a lack of willingness and expectations. I think what you're talking about when parents uh, don't pay their children has to do with expectations. I was expected to read, I was expected to learn, and I found that depending on where the schools are in the difficult neighborhoods, they don't have the same expectations of the kids. Right. And if they had those expectations, they wouldn't have to think about paying them. Because the kids would read books and try hard without money? No, they would have expectations. I don't know how to, uh, you know, oh, the dog ate my homework was not a sufficient excuse in my class. Right. You didn't do your work. In other words, the standards are the same for everyone. And I think when you impose standards, children rise to those standards. All right. And tell us your name. Susan Shine. Susan, what, would ha what grade level did you teach? Fourth and sixth. All right. Fourth and sixth. Now, let's take your fourth grade class. You set high expectations. Some kids still don't get it, still fall short, still don't read books. Wouldn't you like to have as an additional resource a little money on the side? 
No, I don't think I want to encourage them. I, no. And why? Why, why would because that Because I would use other methods. I would use tutoring. I would use extra hours at school. I would use things that don't necessarily cost money, but cost energy. Not, not money, money to the teachers, yes. Maybe not money to the, to the children. <laughs> In other words, yeah. teachers should get paid more if they stay later, if they work harder, if they're, I don't mean incentives for your kids performing better, I mean for trying harder, for okay. actually working longer So if hours. the teachers stay longer and do, do tutoring, and that's one thing. Yes. But this raises an interesting question. There are some school districts that are using cash incentives for teachers based on whether the kids show improvement on standardized tests. You're okay, against that. That's, a, that's an issue that I, makes my blood boil, so I can't even discuss it. <laughs> I, but I <laughs> because take they're it. not getting educated. They're not getting educated. That's not, they're not being taught how to think. They're being taught how to take a test. How to take a test. Do you also think it's disrespectful to the teacher? What, what do you mean by disrespectful to the teacher? To say to the teacher, you get your kids to perform better, we'll pay you a little extra. No, I, I, no, I actually, no. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> I really didn't want, okay. Yeah. I can see it makes your blood boil. It makes my blood boil. <laughs> um, no, I actually think that in the days when we had expectations of right. learning, we were taught to think and the test existed to see how well we I thought. Right. Well we, and we all knew who the good teachers were. <laughs> okay. So. Thank you for that. Yes. R right here. It's a question of whether the end justifies the means. And the end here is to get a non-reader to start reading for $2. I think the end justifies this small amount of money. And the end... What is, is the get, end exactly? The end is to educate the to American... To get, get them to read more books? Yeah, to, to educate them, to try to get the American level of education up to the level of other countries, to educate them. There's someone sitting next to you who disagrees. <laughs> That's your wife. No, <laughs> no, if you pay them, then you destroy their love of learning. You've destroyed the intrinsic value of reading a book. I disagree. All right, that's Adele, right? Okay, what this, let's step back. Let's, I know there are others who would like to get into this. It, it makes a lot of people's blood boil, I can see. But let's step back from this and notice something about the discussion we've had and the arguments people have raised on the two sides. One argument, first, do you want to know, some people say it depends on whether it works. Do you want to know what became of these experiments? Actually, they have mixed results so far. <laughs> Paying extra for good grades did not increase the grades or the test scores in New York City. Some people are relieved to hear that. But in Dallas, the $2 did get the second graders to read more books. It also got them to read shorter books. <laughs> but the larger question The larger question is, and this has come out in some of the comments, what becomes of these, what will become of these kids later when no one is paying them to read? What worries many people here, those who object, seems to be that offering cash to a young person to read a book may actually get them to read that book, but may teach them the wrong lesson about reading, namely that the real goal is to cultivate the love of learning. But then we heard a counter-argument. Yes, the goal is to cultivate the love of learning, but maybe if kids haven't been exposed to reading and learning and the joys of it, that the money, though a lower form of motivation, may kickstart the habit, and then the habit might take and they'll carry on reading for the love of it. That's the counter-argument. And it's difficult to know, in any given case, any given use of a cash incentive, what the effect will be. A friend of mine, 
pays his young children one dollar for each thank you note they write. I've received some of these thank you notes. <laughs> and I can tell by reading them that they were written under a certain pressure. My wife and I look askance at this practice. We wonder how the kids will turn out. Now, it could be that by being paid to write thank you notes, they will get in the habit of writing thank you notes. They will gradually, eventually learn the real reason for writing them, namely the expression of gratitude. And uh, when someone stops paying them, they will carry on writing them. That's the optimistic scenario. Or it could work out the other way. It could be that what they're learning by being paid the dollar is that thank you notes are a form of peace work, a chore to be written for money. And if that's the lesson they learn, when the money stops, so may the thank you notes. They may never learn the virtue of gratitude, and their moral education will have been corrupted. That's the worry. What do these examples and scenarios and debates tell us about how we should think about the use of money and market mechanisms? I think what they teach us is that sometimes money and markets can change the attitudes and the norms that define the meaning of certain goods, in this case, teaching and learning. In Switzerland, some years ago, they were trying to decide where to locate a nuclear waste site. They identified Nobody wants one in their backyard. They identified a small town in the mountains. It's likely to be the safest place for the nuclear storage. But under the law, they had to get the approval of the local community. And so before the decision was made, a survey was done of the residents of this small town in the Swiss mountains. And they asked them, if the parliament chooses this town, would you vote to approve? Despite the risks, 51% said yes. Then they asked a second question. They sweetened the deal. They said, suppose Parliament chooses your town for the nuclear waste site and offers to pay in compensation for the risk each resident of the town an annual sum of money, up to $8,000 a year. Then would you accept it? Now how many do you think said yes? 90? 80? Other guesses? 100%? 40. You think it went down? It went down from 51% to 25%. The number fell in half. Now, why should this be? Why should this be? From the standpoint of standard economic reasoning, if you offer people money to do something, the number of people willing to do that thing should increase. Why did it fall in half? What was happening? What do you think? The risk. So if they're being paid money, they're thinking to themselves, wow, this must be riskier than I thought. They're willing to pay me money to do vote for this. Well, that's one possible hypothesis. But they tested for that. And it turns out that the estimate of the risk was about the same before and after the offer of money, which suggests that something else must have been going on. Anybody ha have another hypothesis? Yes, right there. I think uh, if, if we're offered 8,000 of whatever, it's probably worth more. And we'll see if there's a better offer. I see. <laughs> so they might have been saying if they're willing to go to 8,000, maybe they'll go to 10. <laughs> there might have been a kind of bargaining mentality among some. But they interviewed the people and asked, why did you change your mind, those who had changed from support to opposition when the money was offered. The answer they gave, we didn't want to be bribed. See, it seems that the offer of money changed the character of the activity. Before, 
51% were willing to accept this risk out of a sense of civic responsibility for the sake of the common good. The country needed the energy, the nuclear waste had to go somewhere. If this was the safest place, they were willing to make that sacrifice for the sake of the common good. But now, when money enters the picture, it becomes not a question of, of civic virtue, it becomes a business deal, a transaction. And they were not willing to sell out the safety of themselves and their families for $8,000 a year. So the monetary offer, rather than increasing support, changed the character of the relationship from a civic question, where they responded out of a sense of the common good, to a financial, a pecuniary relationship. In Israel, there were some daycare centers that had a problem, a problem encountered by daycare centers around the world, parents coming late to pick up their kids. A teacher would have to stay with the children until the late arriving parents came. So with the help of some economists, they instituted a fine for late arriving parents. What do you think happened? There were more late arrivals. Now, why should this be? According to standard economic reasoning, charging for something should decrease rather than increase the willingness to consume that thing. So what happened here? Well, something similar to what was going on in the Swiss town. Before, when parents came late, they felt guilty. They were imposing an inconvenience on the teachers. But now when there's a fine, a monetary fine, they treated it as a fee, a fee for a service, like hiring a babysitter. And you don't feel guilty when you pay money to a babysitter to perform the service of looking after your child. So the attitudes changed. The monetary payment changed the relationship between the parents and the daycare center and crowded out the sense of obligation to show up on time. What these examples illustrate is that a central assumption of standard economic reasoning may be flawed. Economists often assume that markets are inert, that they do not touch or taint the goods they exchanged, the, the goods they exchange. This may be true enough if we're talking about material goods, flat screen televisions, toasters, cars. If you sell me a flat screen television or give me one as a gift, it will work just the same either way. The financial transaction doesn't change the character or the value of the good. But the same may not be true when markets enter in to spheres of life traditionally governed by non-market values and attitudes worth caring about. Family life, community life, health, education, the environment, national security, civic life. In these domains, cash incentives, monetary arrangements, financial deals may crowd out values and attitudes that are central to what makes those goods the goods they are. What is, if this is true, what are the implications for the way we should think about these questions? Well, one implication is that we can't decide where markets belong, where they serve the public good, and where they don't belong without reasoning together, without having a public debate about the likely effects of marketizing certain social practices, and a debate about how those goods should be valued, whether it's teaching and learning, or environmental protection, or civic life. This is a debate that we have not had in this country over the past few decades. We've been governed by a kind of market faith that just assumes 
that markets are the primary instrument for achieving the public good. We haven't really questioned that. We've shied away from these debates, and the effect has been that markets have reached into more and more spheres of life, including even the way we fight our, fight our wars and defend our country. In Iraq and Afghanistan, there were more paid military contractors on the ground than there were US military troops. Now, this isn't because we had a public debate about whether we wanted to outsource war to private companies. We looked up and realized that this is what we had come to do. This is how we have come to fight our wars. So what I'm suggesting is that the great missing debate in American public life is a morally engaged debate about where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong. This debate matters not only because we need it to decide whether to use markets for teaching and learning or for national defense. It matters because during this period, one of the most precious civic goods that's been eroded, I think, crowded out by the marketization of everything is commonality, the sense of community that holds democratic societies together. Take a small example from sports. When I was a kid, I've always been a baseball fan. I grew up in Minnesota, and I was a Minnesota Twins fan. And when I would go to a Twins game, there, there were always box seats and bleacher seats. But what do you think was the difference between the most expensive box seat and the cheapest seat in the bleachers? Back, this would have been in the mid-60s. Ten bucks? It was, well, it was 350 for a box seat and a dollar for the bleachers. And the effect was, when you went to a baseball game, this, this was a place where CEOs and mailroom clerks sat side by side. Everyone had to wait in the same long lines for the restrooms. Everyone ate the same soggy hot dogs, drank the same stale beer. And when it rained, everyone got wet. But it's not that way anymore when you go to a baseball game or a football game or pretty much any sports stadium or arena in the country. Now, over the last several decades, we've seen the advent of skyboxes, where the affluent and the privileged can watch games in air-conditioned comfort, far removed from the fans in the stands below. And it's, so it's no longer the case that everyone stands in the same lines for the restroom. And when it rains, not everyone gets wet. This wouldn't matter very much if it only happened in baseball and football stadiums. But something similar has been happening, I think, throughout our society. As at, against a background of rising inequality, as more and more aspects of life are governed by markets, there are fewer and fewer occasions when men and women from different walks of life encounter one another. We live and work and shop and play in different places. Our children go to different schools. You might call it the skyboxification of American life. It's not good for democracy. And and it's not a satisfying way to live, even for those of us who may be privileged enough to watch at least some games from the skyboxes. Why? Democracy doesn't require perfect equality, but it does require that people from different walks of life and different social backgrounds encounter one another, bump up against one another in the course of everyday life. 
because this is how we learn to accommodate and abide our differences. And this is how we come to care for the common good. And so the question of markets, in the end, is not mainly an economic question. It's really a question about how we want to live together. Do we want a society where everything is up for sale? Or are there certain moral and civic goods that markets do not honor and money cannot buy? Thank you very much. Thank you.